Welcome back to part 4 of 4 of our Parasitology Lecture Series on Coccidians. The point of this lecture is to discuss the very famous parasitic organism, Toxoplasma. So when you talk about Toxoplasma, what comes into your mind? The keywords here would be pregnant women, congenital transmission, eye infection, brain infection, and of course, the immunocompromised host. Well, let's get started. Before we go into the organism and the disease, we have to mention the demographic distribution of toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is one of the most common human infections. It has a worldwide prevalence of up to one-third of the population on Earth, with country prevalence ranging from 20 to 75%. In fact, there is one study that estimates that up to 2 billion people are actually infected with toxoplasma. That's 2 billion people in the world. Despite the glaring prevalence of toxoplasmosis in the general human population, most of us are actually not affected. Toxoplasmosis is a primary concern primarily in immunocompromised people as well as in pregnant women. Toxoplasmosis hotspots can also be traced socio-geographically. For instance, in France, toxoplasmosis is attributed to eating undercooked meat, while in Central America, it is attributed to the prevalence of stray cats. Generally speaking, toxoplasma infections have higher rates in warm countries and low altitudes. The causative agent for toxoplasmosis is a protozoan from the genus Toxoplasma, more specifically Toxoplasma gondii. The organism is characterized by a pear-shaped tachyzoid with round oocyst, hence they belong to the class Coccidia. This is the general life cycle of toxoplasma. This is from one of our local books here in the Philippines, as drawn by one of my friends. Please take note of the important animals which are involved in the life cycle of toxoplasma. You have your cats, which is very important. You have your mammals, including humans. And you have your small mammals or birds. Let's try to do a short animation on the life cycle of toxoplasma. The definitive host for toxoplasma are cats, which includes your domestic cats. Inside the cats, toxoplasma undergoes its enteroenteric phase. Cats get infected by toxoplasma through their oral cavity when they ingest an infected organism, infected with your oocysts, and once the oocysts reach the gastrointestinal tract, they would release sporozoites, and these sporozoites would eventually invade the enteric enterocytes. This is quite similar to what we've discussed in parts 1 through 3 of this lecture series. However, in cats, toxoplasma undergoes its sexual reproductive stage. And at the end of that stage, it will result in an unsporulated zygote. Unsporulated oocysts need 1 to 5 days for sporulation in the environment, after which they are picked up by intermediate hosts such as farm animals, usually mice or rats. Oocysts release sporozoites and penetrate the intestinal cells of these smaller animals, and these sporozoites get ingested by the macrophages in the gastrointestinal tract. Inside the macrophages, though, the sporozoites change into a specialized form called your tachyzoites. Tachyzoites are notorious for multiplying rapidly inside the macrophages. Now, as the infected macrophages float around in the body of the intermediate host, they would eventually end up in some organs, commonly the brain and the muscle tissue. Inside these tissues, the tachyzoites then become bradyzoites or bradyzoites, and the bradyzoite form does not multiply rapidly compared to the tachyzoid. As I mentioned earlier, Bradyzoids can be found in neural and muscle tissues. Bradyzoids form cysts which are resistant to the immune system of the host. Now, to complete the life cycle, the infected intermediate host gets ingested by our definitive host, the cat. And upon ingestion, the cyst wall is again degraded by gastric acid and the cycle enters the enteroenteric phase once again. Humans get infected by toxoplasma in a variety of ways. One common way is through petting their pet cats or petting stray cats. Touching litter boxes and food and water contaminated with cat fecal matter can also be a source of infection. 
as well as touching or eating farm animals, which are infected with the organism. Another point of infection is through organ or blood transplantation, and another important mode of transmission is through transplacental transmission. Toxoplasma primarily affects the brain, skeletal muscles, the myocardium, and the eyes. And even in immunocompetent individuals, infections can persist for a lifetime. The symptoms of toxoplasmosis really depends on the immune status of the patient. In immunocompetent people, it is primarily self-limiting as long as it doesn't involve the macula. The most common manifestation in immunocompetent people is painless lymphadenopathy, which usually lasts a few weeks. While some people will manifest with flu-like illness, however, as we mentioned earlier, mild cases are primarily self-limiting. Rarely though, chorioretinitis due to toxoplasma can be seen even in immunocompetent people. The story for immunocompromised infections is rather different. Encephalitis with fever is the most common presentation. And in HIV patients, it is the most common central nervous system infection. It occurs when the CD4 counts dip below 100. From this radiographic image, you can appreciate here a toxoplasma cyst growing inside the brain of a patient. About 20% of toxoplasmosis in immunocompromised people manifests as extracerebral disease. These would involve pneumonitis and chorioretinitis. In extremely rare cases, disseminated infections can also occur. So why are there varying degrees of symptomatology associated with toxoplasma? One point to consider would be the clonal lineage of toxoplasma. So far, there are three types of toxoplasma. And type 1 primarily is the most virulent among the three. Type 2, however, is the most commonly seen form in humans, or at least is more commonly isolated. And type 2 also is the more commonly seen in immunocompromised individuals. Type 1, however, is more associated with a congenital form of toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasma, similar to a lot of the coccidians we've already discussed, also resides in parasitiferous vacuoles, and the PV resists acidification and fusion with endosomes and lysosomes, and it also recruits host mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum, which may aid in nutrient acquisition of the parasite. The parasitiferous vacuole here is this entire covering here, and it forms a protective barrier against cellular destruction. Vacuole formation is actually initiated by secretion from a bulb-shaped organelle called the ROP3 here, which contains a diverse array of proteins that are released directly into the host cell and into the forming vacuole. So the main parasite virulence genes would be the ROP3 neck proteins, or RONs, and ROP3-derived serine threonine kinases, or ROPs. RONs open the plasma membrane for entry, while ROPs are secreted as parasite infects cells and modulate virulence processes in the nucleus and the parasitiferous vacuole. Interleukin-12 is mainly secreted by dendritic cells in the, in the lamina propria of the epithelium and is part of the innate immune response. Interleukin-12 also triggers the release of interferon gamma, mainly from CD4 or CD8 positive T cells and also natural killer cells, and this leads to long-term protection of the individual. This is part of the adaptive humoral response. Please take note though that the main immune system player here that controls toxoplasma populations in the body would be your macrophages. A more recent article from the Thailand Medical News outlet adds something to the mix. Let's go into the internet. Breaking, toxoplasma gondii. University of Virginia study says that about 2 billion people have a brain parasite spread by cats and contaminated meat. Let's try to zoom in. This is a relatively new article published in August 1, 2020 by Toxoplasma Gondai. I want to zoom in to this part wherein it says 
that the study team from UVA found that the parasite Toxoplasma gondii is kept in check by brain defenders called microglia. These microglia release a unique immune molecule, interleukin-1A, that recruits immune cells from the blood to control the parasite in the brain. And this immune cell that they are talking about are activated macrophages, which we've discussed earlier. Another point from this article states that microglia must die to save the brain from the infection. In short, the rupture of microglia releases interleukin-1A, and the interleukin-1A would recruit the other immune cells, including the macrophages. Now let's go to congenital toxoplasmosis. These are the symptoms associated with congenital toxoplasmosis. Highlighted in yellow is the triad of congenital toxoplasmosis, while highlighted in red are the symptoms associated with severe congenital toxoplasmosis. Please take note that severe congenital toxoplasmosis also includes the triad. We can't really discuss the entirety of congenital toxoplasmosis, so here are a few other points. Congenital toxoplasmosis is mostly from transplacental infection. Rates can be as high as 1 in 1,000 live births, but 75% of newborns have subclinical infections. Asymptomatic neonates are prone to reactivation and appearance of symptoms later in life, usually in their second or third decade of life. The most common reactivation manifestations would be chorioretinitis, cerebrospinal fluid abnormalities, and impaired psychomotor development. Here is a graph of collated data regarding fetus infection rates relative to the time of maternal infection. I've collated the data and I've made a very simple graph. Now let's try to analyze this graph. From this graph, we can see that infections up to three months before conception are actually possible, although rare. We can also see that fetal infection rates increase relative to conception. And this is manifested with the blue line, wherein first trimester infection rates are around 10%, while second trimester infection rates can reach around 50%. And near term, up to 100% infection rates are possible, which is very astonishing. However, infection severity decreases as the term nears, which is highlighted by the red graph. In short, early fetal infections would result to spontaneous abortions, stillbirths, severe neurologic and ophthalmologic deficits, while late fetal infections can be asymptomatic. The key message here is the timing of infection of the fetus is very important. The diagnosis of toxoplasmosis is very broad. We've learned earlier that toxoplasma invades practically all the tissues of the human body, and therefore diagnosis can also be far-ranging. This would include the detection of positive toxoplasma immunoglobulins, Imaging techniques such as CT scans and, and more appropriately MRI can also be helpful. If you're looking at ophthalmologic complaints, fundoscopy and retinal exams can be used. For suspected pregnancies, ultrasound can give nonspecific but helpful findings, usually hydrocephalus or intracranial calcifications. And other diagnostic tests can be used, including PCR and ELISA. Treatment for toxoplasma infections include a variety of combination drugs, but more commonly associated with the drug pyrimethamine. Folinic acid, also known as leucovorin, is a medication used to decrease the toxic effects of pyrimethamine. The duration of treatment in immunocompetent people is, of course, shorter than those of immunocompromised status. Ocular toxoplasmosis is also treated with pyrimethamine sulfadiazine combination and corticosteroids may be used to minimize inflammation of the macula. In pregnant women, pyrimethamine sulfadiazine is a teratogen. Therefore, its use is recommended only after the first or second trimester. In earlier pregnancies, spiramycin is actually used. The main target of all these antitoxoplasma drugs are the tachyzoids. Due to the worldwide distribution of toxoplasmosis, 
public health strategies have been developed. Regulations regarding reservoir hosts, including domestic and wild or stray cats, have been defined in some countries. In some areas, similar to the other coccidians that we've talked about, sanitary policies on municipal water systems are also implemented. People should also be aware that toxoplasmosis can be a waterborne disease. As far as pregnant women are concerned, here are a few toxoplasma prevention tips. Wear gloves when you handle the soil. Avoid eating raw meat. Wash your food before eating. Don't drink unpasteurized milk. Cover your children's sandboxes, especially when there are cats around. And as much as possible, when you are pregnant, try to avoid cats. For the cat lovers out there, keep your cats indoors. Don't feed your cats raw meat. Don't adopt stray cats or kittens unless properly treated. Clean litter boxes properly. And when cleaning litter boxes, change the litter box every day. Clean them with scalding water. Wear gloves and wash your hands after. Take note that soap and even chemicals are not usually effective against the oocyst. As a last point, the worldwide prevalence of co-infection of HIV and toxoplasmosis is around 38%. Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for the highest prevalence of co-infection. All income bracket countries are affected, but usually low-income countries generally have higher co-infection rates. That is something to think about. That concludes the lecture on toxoplasma. And that also ends the Parasitology Lecture Series on Coccidians. I hope you learned something. See you in another video. And thanks for watching. If you learned something, feel free to share this video. And don't stop learning.